I mean, I use it to help our guys change their perception about themselves and get them back into you know, being a warrior like they were before they had their injuries. You know, a lot of people, oh, you poor little guy, whatever. It's not like that. This is about, hey, I'm a human being and I want to get out and compete. TV show where I host and post a new episode with a new guest in a new location every week. This week's guest is Kevin Orr. He's the head coach for the Japan National Paralympic Rugby Team. Kevin has a long history of coaching and he played point guard on a national championship winning wheelchair basketball team in college. So I packed up and headed to the 2019 Four Nations Wheelchair Rugby Invitational at the Lakeshore Foundation in Birmingham, Alabama. There's a reason the sport was once referred to as murder ball. These games are super intense. It's athletes pushing themselves and their equipment to the extreme, and after a close game in which Japan lost by one point to the U.S. in overtime, I got a chance to speak with head coach Kevin Orr about murder ball, a.k.a. Paralympic Rugby. So wheelchair rugby just carries the name rugby because of the contact nature of the sport. But otherwise, rules and everything really are totally different. It's kind of got elements of football, hockey, basketball, things that people are very familiar with. So it was invented for people that had uh, disuse of their upper extremities and lower extremities that were trying to play wheelchair basketball, but were always sidelined or whatever. So wheelchair rugby was invented to give them a chance to play competitive sport because you had high-level athletes that were riding the pine. Here at Lakeshore, when I when I started the team, I had a player that was, he was recruited by Dean Smith to play basketball. Then he was in a car accident, lost use of his hands and legs. Um, and he was playing wheelchair basketball, six foot eight, great pedigree to play sport. And he was essentially just sidelined because of his function. When we brought him here, he was able to play a sport that was really uh, allowing him to use his full potential and play uh, elite sport again. And that's really the purpose of wheelchair rugby. How often does something like this happen? Not very often. Usually an event like this where the top four teams in the world get together happens about probably every six years because of schedules and finances and everything like that. So uh, the fact that we could get together, I mean, the, the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics are a big deal for everybody. Everyone wants to win gold. Okay, where are you from and how did you become the head coach of the Japanese Paralympic rugby team? Like, what in the world? That's amazing. Well, uh, long story short, I suppose, is I'm originally from Illinois. I grew up in the Chicago suburbs, went to the University of Illinois. I was a, two, uh, a double athlete. I was a Paralympic track athlete and I played wheelchair basketball at the University of Illinois. I won four national championships to the University of Illinois uh, as the point guard. Um, but I was also a therapeutic recreation student, had to have some volunteer experience, and they were starting wheelchair rugby there. In 1989 is when I got my start as a volunteer uh, with the University of Illinois wheelchair rugby program. I did an internship at Lakeshore Hospital and Lakeshore Foundation in 1990, um, and they asked me to start a wheelchair rugby team. It wasn't until 92 that we actually got the team formed and going. I built the team um, into a national power. We, we won five consecutive national championships, we appeared in 11 uh, national finals. So uh, I was also the U.S. coach uh, from 1999 to 2004. Ironically, I lost as the head coach. I was the first head coach of the Americans to lose a major final, lost world championship final, took silver medal to Canada. Um, in Athens at the Paralympics, uh, again, lost to Canada in the semifinal. They let me go. Um, it's kind of like Alabama Auburn football. Um, but living here in Pelham, Alabama, seeing Alabama Auburn football as a coach, you understand high performance is what you're looking for. It's no different for Paralympic sport. So as being a former Paralympic track athlete, I was asked to be part of the um, U.S. track and field team and coach their wheelchair athletes. So I did that from 2005 to 2008. And I was in the village, ironically, um, after Japan lost. And uh, Shinichi Shimakawa, who plays for our team, 
He's like, you need to be the next head coach for Japan. And I, that kind of planted the seed in me. But I'm like, no, I wasn't ready to do that because I'm very patriotic American. Um, so I'm like, no, I'm not there That's yet. tough, right. But then in, uh, in 2008, I was asked by the Canadians, and you see the irony here is I lost to Canada, lost my job as the U.S. coach, and they asked me to be their head coach. So I was the head coach of Canada uh, from 2009 through 2016. Uh, we won a silver medal in London, and then we ended up in fourth place, losing to Japan um, in, the, uh, in the bronze medal match. And so I was released as the head coach in Canada. And a week before, Canada actually, uh, excuse me, Japan had sent me an email asking if I wanted to be their head coach. And Japan is hosting the Paralympics in 2020. So I'm like, well, this is great. But the, I'm like, you know, my... I go to church here in Alabama and I do all this. How is this all going to work out? <laughs> right. um, so they're like, well, you can continue to do like you did with um, when you were coaching Canada. Because when I was coaching Canada, you have players that are spread throughout the country. So they only do training camps. So there are eight to 10 day training camps that all the players and staff come together and train. Otherwise, they train in their decentralized environments with their own teams and their own coaches and their own people. Um, so bringing in the national coach, um, I would just fly in, do a national team training camp and, and train. Um, and that's how we did the national team with Canada. So that was the arrangement that we're doing now. So I fly from Pelham, Alabama and go to Tokyo or other parts of Japan because the players are spread all throughout Japan. And we get together in Tokyo or in Sapporo or different parts. We've been in Okinawa. Um, so we get, I get to see some of the different parts of Japan, but it's, uh, I'm essentially a fly-in coach, but I'm, they pay me full-time staff. I worked here at Lakeshore Foundation full-time, and um, they they were I, I, Canada offered me fifteen thousand dollars more than what I was making, and my kids were young at the time. And when I worked here, I was never home when they were home. So I'm like, this is a great opportunity for me to to be with my kids and be a dad, um, and make a little bit more money and coach one sport because I when I worked here, I coached track and field kids track and field, rugby, I, I was kind of the jack of all trades. So it kind of filtered down what I could do. So it was really, um, I'm like, man, I get to coach one sport. It's, coach, it's a sport I love. Um, and I, I think I'm pretty good at it. So it, it, it's, it's really an honor to think, you know, other countries want to have an outsider uh, come in and coach their team. So really just thinking of, of coaching being a global kind of thing, you know, we've seen it with Don Nelson coaching with the winning basketball team. You see it with New Zealand. Their rugby coaches coach all around the world. Uh, the U.S. had a German soccer coach. So I thought, well, this is no different. Um, and the respect that I have um, for the Japanese players in the program is just unbelievable. <laughs> One of the highlights of the day was I got a chance to talk to one of the Japanese assistant coaches, uh, Noriko, and one of the Japanese Paralympic rugby players from Kevin's team, that's Tomark Imai. Noriko acted as a translator as I spoke to them both. Thank you guys for coming to the United States to come play some rugby. How did you end up getting involved, both of you guys, how did y'all end up getting involved with uh, Paralympic rugby? Uh, First, he, he was um, asked to play with a rugby with his teammate. Your hair is amazing. <laughs> is that a requirement on the team to have really good hair? <laughs> and what about you? How did you get involved? Um, after graduating university, I started um, um, learning um, adopted physical education. And what position do you play? teammate. Which rugby has a sports class? It's yeah. not like we like unlike basketball. Like we don't have like a forward or center or okay. anything like it's like a class. And how long have you been playing? This is his tenth year. Ten years. He's been playing which rugby for ten years now. And what part of Japan are you from? Chiba. Um, he's from Chiba, right next to Tokyo Prefecture. Has has rugby? Um, what opportunities has this opened up for for you? Playing the rugby gives him a lot of opportunity to visit many different countries and meet different people and different uh, which rugby players. And now, like we, like other countries, we 
sort of make like a rich rugby family. So it's really nice to um, see some familiar faces at the tournament. And he likes, he likes a team sports. So he plays for someone else, but someone else, you know, plays for him. So that kind of um, dynamic he loves. So it's really, um, and, then, and then as a team, they work together to achieve something great. So that is, that is really great things that um, Richard Rugby gives him. How do you go about translating for the team? Because Kevin, he speaks English, a little bit of Japanese too? Yes, he does. And then you do a lot of some of more like the complicated translating and stuff for the coach? Something really interesting happened to me is, yeah, I really assist to communicate the both sides, mm -hmm. but they have, you know, it, it's, it might sound um, odd, but just uh, they speak the same language, that's rugby because they both understand rugby. Sometimes like there's, you know, players speaking in Japanese and Kevin is speaking in English, of course, but sometimes, you know, they understand each other. And then that's something really amazing. Uh, what has been your favorite country to play rugby in and your least favorite country to play in? And which country play in? America. One of the most um, pleasant places to play with rugby is definitely in America yeah. because, um, of course, like a team is great and also like a, he really appreciates the spectators mm. because, of course, they are cheering in America, but even so, they are really great um, creating really good atmosphere, so he really appreciates it. It's a pleasure to meet you. I have a time talking to you. Thank you so much for, just for sitting down and talking to me. And, and wow, that was an amazing game on the court just now. I couldn't believe the ending. It went into overtime. It was <laughs> yes. amazing. So uh, keep up the great work, and thank you so much for coming and, and visiting our country and coming to the Lakeshore Foundation to play, and, and keep up the good work, and good luck to you in the rest of the tournament. It would have been great if we could if we had won. I know! <laughs> so close! So very close! I see you've got sponsors on some of your jerseys and things like that. Is that is that where all your funding comes from, or is this like trickling down all the way from the Olympics? Like, where does your funding for this kind of stuff come from? Well, it varies by country. Okay. Um, so, uh, Japan gets some support from a foundation, and then they have to raise the money. So, the sponsors that are on the jersey, they pay to be on the jersey, to be on the chair, to be on things of the bench. Uh, individual companies help support the individual players, which is another cool thing, really, because players can dedicate their time to training instead of having to go work a full-time job and then get the training in. And that's honestly how the Americans do it. The Americans get some support from Lakeshore Foundation. They get some from the Olympic Committee, um, from U.S. Paralympics, and then they have some of their own sponsors as well. Um, GB used to be well-funded. Um, but they hadn't meet, met the podium. Um, so uh, they, they lost their funding after Rio. Um, so they, they've had to go out and just, hey, we need some cash to run the program. So they've got a lot of support and they're tied in with able-bodied rugby. And that's huge in, uh, in England or in the UK. So they've got some good connections with World Rugby. And World Rugby is actually tied in with wheelchair rugby as a partner. Uh, which is neat because, you know, just different forms of rugby and they, they embrace us as part of their, their sport, even though the rules are completely different. Um, Australia is funded by their government. Uh, Canada has a program called Own the Podium, which is really government funded that's trickled down to their program. So it really varies from country to country. But, um, you know, as soon as people recognize that this is a legitimate sport, it could be a professional sport. I mean, I've said that. I've been involved with the game for 30 years. You know, the documentary Murder Ball, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I was the U.S. head coach uh, with Murder Ball. And, you know, we thought, okay, that's going to help this thing kick off. But, you know, people have so many stereotypes or stigmas about a wheelchair. You know, yeah, I'm a wheelchair user, but the idea is the wheelchair, it creates freedom. It creates movement. It gives you opportunities to do, you know, sport. It, it allows, I mean, I use it to help our guys change their perception about themselves and get them back into you know, being a warrior like they were before they had their injuries. You know, a lot of people, oh, you poor little guy, whatever. It's not like that. This is about, hey, I'm a human being and I want to get out and compete. I want to be the same person I was before. I just have these different limitations. And that's really what these sports are all about. 
And until people, you know, they get past looking at the disability part of it and actually see the sport, you know, this is one of, this is a powerful sport. If you love, you know, UAB, Alabama, Auburn football, this is no different. It's, um, I mean, to me, you're competing. You know, when we play the, the four teams that are here, um, you add Canada to the mix. I mean, that's, that's like the SEC conference. It's that caliber or the West uh, conference. Um, I mean, so when you're, when you're playing, you know, Texas A&M and, you know, you're playing um, Ole Miss and you're playing Mississippi State, I mean, there's no off game. You play LSU, Donna Baton Rouge. I mean, you come here to the U.S. I mean, we had the chance to win the last game. You know, you got their crowd in the game. You know, wouldn't it be great to be in an arena where you're playing in front of like 50,000 people and they're cheering and going? I had that opportunity as the Canadian coach. They host the Pair Pan Am Games in 2015, playing the Americans, the number one ranked team in the world. We're the number four ranked team in the world playing against the number one. We beat them at the Pair. We were down three um, going into the fourth quarter, came back and beat them by three. They sold tickets to that game in an arena that had 3,000 people. It was sold out two days before the game. Because, you know, you got the hype, U.S., Canada, Pair Pan Am Games. It, to me, the environment was, it was rich. And I mean, if, if, if people embrace this thing, man, it's like, wow, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a cool thing. But I think people got to get past that we use chairs. You know, it's, uh, it's a game. I would call them like battle tanks instead of chairs. These things, you can tell they're like used. My goodness, they're, they are beat to pieces, these chairs are. But you can hear them right outside that door. Every play, every you're, you're positioning yourself on the field trying to get that right angle. And just like the players bang in rugby, these players are banging out here on this field. It, it, it is amazing. Does the chair kind of help create just a little bit of a barrier to, to keep people from getting injured? The chairs take the bulk of the contact. Right. You know, that's why it makes good loud noise. But, you know, sometimes you can get your hand pinched between the chairs or, you know, all the use that you have because you're just using – simple muscle groups that weren't designed to propel the body, you know, and just work and work and work. And you have a lot of overuse issues in the shoulders. Um, but as far as big injuries, you know, it's not as significant as one would think. Concussions sometimes, because you flip over backwards, hit your head. Um, we try to set the chair up so it's as stable base as possible. Yeah, uh, I saw that on a, a typical wheelchair, you see the big wheel, and that's kind of your drive wheel that you're using your hands to push and stuff. And then the front wheels, those are usually a little bit smaller on standard wheelchairs. I noticed that you guys have back wheels as well to almost make it like a square rolling around rather than – and I could see how that could add a lot of stability too. Well, having anti-tips. And then you'll have offensive chairs that have uh, – we call them wings, but basically to keep the uh, other team from being able to grab their chair because you can only uh, – hold a person with chair on chair. You can't grab their wheelchair. Um, and then we have players with less function that use uh, more of a bumper that uses that we try to hold players. So, you know, there's always that game of going back and forth with the chair design. Um, and there are specifications like NASCAR would have, um, you know, to, to set up your chair. You have to have certain measurements within those parameters. So, you know, you're not getting away with something unfair. So, you know, we, you design the chairs to you know, and put your players in the personnel uh, to, to match what you want to try to get out of that player. I can't believe you were the head coach in murder ball. Yes. I can't believe that. that, that how, how big was that murder ball documentary for helping spread awareness? Well, I think it was good within our community, within disability community, but I, I, they did a limited release to the theaters, um, which was disappointing. I mean, so even in our community, which – you know, Lakeshore Foundation is a big supporter of Paralympic sport. We, we had a limited bite as far as what we could get in our community to, to get the word out. I mean, it's, um, that was disappointing to me. And that's how it was across the country is, you know, it was very limited group uh, places where you did it. I think overall it was good. I mean, at Sundance, it, you know, it was good. It was up for an Oscar. It lost to March of the Penguins. Um, I mean, but it was right there. And Mark Zupan ended up going to the Oscars and representing uh, our team, which was great. Um, he, he was a great ambassador. And when Murder Ball was out, he would go talk to community groups. Um, he, did, he did a lot of funny things. Um, you know, he was in the Jackass movies and did some things like that. That uh, You know, it, it was him. It was, you know, and, and they portrayed him as he was. He didn't do anything that was, 
you know, he he drops the f bomb and he's you know that's that's him. It's uh, uh, well, every other word out of his mouth. Well, and as a Christian, it's difficult because I'm like you know well, uh, <laughs> sure. it's not me. Right, but at right. the same time, you know you got you want to showcase the sport of where it's at, right? It's uh, you know um, it it was funny because. He was like that, but then when he come around me, he, he was very polite, um, great guy. Uh, so he went to Georgia Tech in civil engineering, um, so you know you have this hard uh, guy kind of image that they're portraying in the documentary. But I mean, you, you got a guy that went to Georgia Tech as an engineer, um, and a lot of people don't know that about him. Very smart, brilliant man. <laughs> your players had a traumatic injury that that put them in a wheelchair and is that the situation for a lot of your players uh, many people did either an illness or uh, injury you know it, it varies because some people get uh, we have a couple players on our team with Charcot Marie tooth syndrome which so they start losing function in their hands and legs and extremities so uh, we have um, and one of our strong players isn't here this week but that's his disability um, other people go through a traumatic um, Yukinobu Ike, who is our tall high pointer, number 21, he was in a car accident where a lot of the stuff um, burned basically the whole left side of his body. So the burns, um, he had to have his left leg amputated and then his, um, he lost a lot of function in his left arm and left side trunk and had multiple skin grafts and things like that. So, you know, people see the gruesome side of that, but like my disability, I grew up um, with a congenital disability. So from birth, I've had this. I have an identical twin that has no disability. So the cool thing with me is I always learned there was really nothing different, just had to do things differently. And really that's what I've tried to teach. You know, when I, whether it's doing kids programs here or teaching world-class wheelchair rugby, the idea is you're trying to bring out human potential. So whatever the circumstances, you know, if they were in a car accident and had a spinal cord injury or had some sort of amputation or whatever it is, hey, let's, what did you do before? You know, let's get it going. Uh, the woman that plays on our team, she was a tumbling and trampoline athlete in Japan and fell when she was doing one of her routines and broke her neck. Um, I looked at it as a great opportunity because this is a woman that trained every day with sport. So it was easy for me to transfer that knowledge of sport into getting involved with wheelchair rugby. And the cool thing is, um, if you're familiar with manga, uh, the Japanese have uh, done two manga books on Kai Karahashi um, and kind of talked about that whole thing where she lost function or, you know, she was a gymnast and then now she's playing, uh, representing her country in wheelchair rugby, which, you know, it's a transformation really. And it's a change of what people do. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, many people, they compete at high school or college and then they end up not playing. You know, if they end up with an injury afterwards, it's all about the recruiting, like, well, what did you do before? Well, I played, you know, there's, there's a kid that the U.S. is actually recruiting from Tallahassee, Alabama. Um, he was in a motorcycle accident. Um, his his one-year anniversary was a year ago. But all the U.S. players are coming in and talking to him about, hey, you could play this and you could be, you know, you could be the future for our team. So it's, you know, many times people look at the disability as being a bad thing. But, you know, we look at it as an opportunity to, to just move on with life. How do you see this like being an important thing to a lot of these players in their lives? Well, I think this is huge. When I coached the team here, you know, basically the guys were collecting a social security check and thinking this is all I'm going to do. You know, I'm not going to be anything, you know, living on living with their parents and doing that kind of stuff. I'm like, no, man, you know, you got to you got to get out. You got to be you. Um, you can't let this define who you are. Um, and I mean, that's the way I was always, uh, I was raised, you know, my brothers were expected to do things. I was expected to do things, you know, do my chores. You know, I, I started swimming at an early age, but it's the same thing with this is um, when I left here, every single player on our team was working or going to school. Um, people getting married, having kids, living away from their parents. I mean, to me, that's one of the things that this sport, 
outside of the high performance, it's like, it, it's a life changer because you can learn so much. Well, how do you drive? How do you do this? How do you do that? You know, how do you get your chair in and out of the car? You know, how do you get dressed? And you know, some people, they're like, well, I, I'm going to have to have help. Or that's the perception. You know, and, and frankly, a lot of the healthcare providers almost feed into that. They're like, well, you're this level injury. You need to be in a power chair because you're going to blow out your shoulders. I'm thinking, no, you're going to end up with cardiovascular problems if you don't push a manual chair. And are you going to be really weak when you first start? Yes. But really, when I got started, um, I was a cocky wheelchair basketball player. Um, I was a point guard winning national championships and saw this guy um, at Illinois. And he was a very high level quad. And he uh, basically a 0.5 level of what, so it's the lowest level function that we have as far as rugby. He was an electric chair user. Uh, he was military. And so I would dog him. He's like four or five years older than me. I'm like, I, I would tell him that electric chair is going to kill you. Um, and then they started the wheelchair rugby program. So they started doing a two man lift and putting him in manual wheelchair. And it took him like 20 to 30 minutes to push from baseline to baseline when he started out. But I'm like, you just got to keep going. Well, six years later, um, he made the U.S. team um, and played for the U.S. team at uh, going to Toronto. But that's not the end of that story. He also was working and selling durable medical equipment. So there was a rugby tournament down in Valdosta, Georgia. And this is a guy that used to drive his power chair and connect to the um, frame and drive from his power chair. He had this gig down in Valdosta. So he flew into Atlanta and then he rented a car and then he had to take apart his wheelchair and put it in the back seat and do a sliding board transfer to get in the car and drive down from Atlanta to Valdosta um, so he could wheel his, his goods, you know, sell his medical equipment and do that. And to me, I'm like, if he hadn't got involved with wheelchair rugby, he would have never done that. And he was making six figures a year selling medical equipment. And it, if it wasn't because of his involvement, it would have never changed his perception of the, the things that he could do. And I mean, to me, that impressed me. And that's what really started my passion to get involved with this is because this is life changing for guys, man. It's, uh, you know, you get people that think, you know, literally no hand function, maybe biceps and deltoids. You know, what am I going to do now? Um, and it's all about changing the, changing the perception and changing your expectation. I think that's what wheelchair rugby's done. Do you think that you also being in a chair helps you coach these guys? You, and you've coached so many different teams. Do you think it helps you relate more to these players and the players re relate more to you? The, the players maybe listen to you more? Well, I think anyone that talks to them as if they're people um, is easy, but it's easy for me to get into it. You know, I'm not eligible to play this sport because I have too much function. Um, the other coaches that are here, have either they've all played wheelchair rugby. Um, and I always thought that would be a, a hindrance to me because I wasn't there. But, you know, I'd done other sports. I mean, I started coaching the team here at Lakeshore when I was 22. So, um, and then telling these older men to do it. I, I think it's more the mindset is of a coach. But, you know, players have to buy into what you're doing. And you have to know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> I, I, when I started coaching here, I was completely different philosophy from what the norm, what the U.S. coach, the U.S. coach, we would play them. He coached Tampa at the time. And it was a different style of play. They were ball control and um, they wanted to slow the game down. I was about innovation and trying to get the game up to where it would be appealing to the public. I'm the reason why there's a shot clock um, because we, this game was boring, man. You know, it's just like pass here, hold the ball. Um, we, we used to hold a tournament down in the old gym single court gym. There were 200 people in that little gym. So great atmosphere. Tampa got a lead. Um, and then they chewed seven and a half minutes just playing keep away. We couldn't get the ball away from them. They just played keep away, scored last goal. And the, the, I mean, it, the atmosphere died. So I said, the next year we're doing something different. So I, I added a shot clock. First time we did it as a 45 second shot clock. Then I went to the national general assembly at, for the league and told them, we need to have this because it'll be more appealing for fans. And they're like, what fans? I'm like, that's exactly right. That's what I'm saying is that you, you guys have that mindset of, of that. And I mean, we're talking about changing perception of disability. Now we're talking about 
we want you guys to be legit athletes for people to come watch you for the excitement of the game, not just because, oh, well, I feel sorry for you. You're my family, so I'm just going to come hang out. That's not it. Come see this because it's a cool game. I mean, to me, that's uh, – the, the game has so much more to it than just, hey, you can change the individual, but hopefully, too, you can change – the way people view people with disabilities by watching what they're able to do. I mean, these guys, you know, I was a pretty good basketball player in my day, but the, what these guys can get out of the lack of function that they have is truly amazing. Where do you see the sport going forward? If I had anything to do with it, I'd love to see it go into a professional area because right now you play with national teams. So it would be cool to see some of the best players from each country play. They have professional wheelchair basketball in Europe um, where you know, they, the, the owners of the teams, they raise money and then they bring in, they bring in players and then they, they sell tickets and sell out their gyms. You could do that, I think, with wheelchair rugby. I mean, to me, that would be, it, it's kind of like what's happened in the NBA. I mean, you, you see the Milwaukee Bucks versus the Toronto Raptors and you, you, know, you have Spain represented, you have Africa represented, you have the United States represented. To me, that's where I think you could sell it and market it. But, you know, people first have to view this as sport before it's really going to take hold. You know, I, I think it's getting there. I'd love to see it happen in my lifetime. But, you know, as far as visions of those kind of things happening, I, I can see it. Um, you know, the Paralympics is great. You know, it's going to be exciting to see it in Tokyo in 2020. You know, because the way that, um, you know, we, we think about these sponsors. You know, these sponsors are paying good money to be on the shirt, you know, and they're not doing it for charity. Whereas in the United States, you know, they're looking at it as a charity. Th these guys are looking at it as a marketing opportunity. I mean, we have Mitsubishi, which most people here in the U S are, are familiar with that brand is they're giving us a lot of money. Uh, Japan airlines is giving us a lot of money because they want their logo to be seen by the world. And to me, that's, that's a difference than being a charity. And I, I think, once the sport gets past the charity form, um, I think then it evolves into something greater. Um, but then the athletes also, and I think the athletes have done this, I mean, especially with the teams that are here, is you have to train like an athlete. You have to eat like an athlete. You have to be an athlete. And th that's something that people would say, well, they're not doing that either. And I'd argue, you know, when I was an athlete, I mean, I ate, drank uh, everything that I was an athlete, you know, and I was running, you know, a sub three minute, 1500 meter. You know, and, and people are like, oh, it's because you have wheels. It's like, no, you have to train your, your body to, to get to that performance. And, you know, it's just getting past some of those kind of things. Olympic athletes would look at us and go, well, they're getting all the perks of what we're doing and not having to do it. It's like, no, these guys are putting in the same amount of work and effort um, as they are and not, don't have the resources that those programs have. Yeah, you may have wheels, but it's not like a bicycle where it's geared. You are doing step by step, almost, you know, like push, push to push is almost equal to step to step. The, the amount of maneuverability that these guys have out on the court, I should say guys and gals, I was really surprised to see some females out there. Like, this is serious, like, but they're, they're out there getting after it and you can see they're causing problems for people that, that they're causing the right problems that they need to cause, you know? It's just, it's amazing. There's, there's soccer in there. It was, you know, just my experience, like field position is so important, that kind of thing. But there's, I mean, obviously rugby with the, the occasional bounce that they have to do, that's wild. And I look at the scores and it's like 50 to 51. And I'm like, how in the world could it be 50 to 51? But it's just in the same way like a basketball game can be 100 to 101 pretty easily. It gets into, you know, time, shot clock. Uh, it's amazing. It's a super cool sport that you're, you're coaching, my friend. What would you say um, is the difference between coaching U.S. players, can Canadian players, Japanese players? What differences do you see just in the, besides the language? You know, I, I heard you speaking a good bit of Japanese as well, but you also have a translator. What, do you, what would you say is some of the inherent differences in, in, in coaching uh, Canadian players, American players versus Japanese players or some, some other players that you've coached as well? Well, I think the North American players uh, – um, they don't always listen. Um, uh, and there's a distinct difference. I mean, the, the, the Japanese player, you as a coach, this is what we're going to do. That's what you do. I mean, in, in when either North American team, the U.S. or Canada, when I was coaching them, as you begin to coach, you get, oh, well, this is the way we do it, or this is how we should do it. And it's like, mm, you know, I, I can't see that happening 
Um, I, I mean, to me, that's not, it's not healthy. Uh, but, you know, I was also coaching a U.S. club team when I was here. So, you know, the guys that I was coaching and would add them to a team, you know, they were successful with their own style. You know, as a coach, I have to recognize there's more than one way to do it. But I can't imagine that, you know, someone's going to go to Gus Malzahn and tell him, well, this is how I'm going to do it, coach. Um, well, and for sure with Nick Saban. And, and then Coach Saban, when he works with his new guys, because he always has a new staff that comes in, you know, he instills what they need to do. And that's really what I did when I went to Japan is it was simple things that I, I did. And it resulted in a world championship. I think people saw that with me is, you know, the players respect what I want. Uh, that's why they had me come. So they respect what I wanted to do, and it resulted in a world championship. So to me, um, it, was, it was a great honor to represent Japan uh, because we were playing the style of play that I think is conducive for them to win. And, um, you know, my style doesn't work with everybody. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm all about go, go, go. Uh, there's some people that they want to play that chill and whatever. It's like I, I, I still want it to be appealing for people to watch, but I also think it's the, that's the future of the game. Some of my players here, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's almost like that trader. I'm like, no, this is the profession that I'm in and I want to do well wherever I go. Yeah, yeah. It's just the way, it's just a part of the business. It's just the way it goes. I understand people, you know, have their teams that they root for, but those players change and those coaches change. Really, you're, you're rooting for a uniform when it comes down to it. And really, just good competition, good sport, competitive play, that's really really what we all want to see when it, when it all boils down to it. So if you are, if you're making that happen um, and you're winning games, then you, as a coach, you got to go where you, where you feel led to go, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it's, it's part of being a coach. It's just the inherent, in, inherent part of being a coach. My mom's dad was a coach all growing up. He taught PE and all that kind of thing. And there's just a coach personality is just a coach. You know what I'm saying? You just get it and you obviously have that. Uh, thank you so, so much for sitting here and joining me uh, and, and talking to me about this. Thanks for letting me check this out. Uh, we'll be keeping track of you guys as 2020 Olympics are on their way. They're, 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 they're going to be here before we know it. Man, uh, I just got tons of respect for you in your attitude and the way you coach, the way you carry yourself, the way you handle yourself. You were too kind to um, let me get your cell phone number and reach out to you and ask if this weird guy with long hair could sit and talk to you about some a really cool, interesting, unique sport that is, uh, it's global and it opens doors for tons and tons of people. You know, growing up with a disability, I swam on the swim team when I was like four years old. Um, I tried to play soccer, but they told me that I, and I walked on crutches. So they said that I would hit their shins with my crutches. So they wouldn't let me do that. My dad finished second at state in wrestling. So my brothers were wrestlers and I would sit there and watch. And then I finally told my mom, I said, I can do this. And she let me um, after keeping on her. So I wrestled from basically fifth grade um, through my sophomore year in high school. And the only reason why I got into a different sport is I learned about wheelchair sports when I was a sophomore. Um, mm -hmm. I learned of a program at the University of Illinois for wheelchair sports. So I transitioned from a wrestler into basketball and then learned about wheelchair racing and everything else that's available. And it's just sport is exactly what you're saying is it brings all that energy and it transforms it to what it needs to be. It transforms, transforms it into something you can practice and get better at and push yourself and challenge yourself and other people can watch and be excited about. It's a really cool thing. So, yeah. and uh, you mentioned that you're a Christian and you know, just being a, an ambassador for all of those things, uh, it's just, uh, I just got a huge amount of respect for you. So thank you again for being on this thing. Well, you know, it's preach the word to all nations, not just here in the U.S. <laughs> and to me, it's uh, having opportunities to do that is just wonderful. And I think that's where, how God's using me um, in this circumstance, because only God could do that. In the remaining games in the tournament, the Japan team bounced back, beating Great Britain on Friday and beating Australia on Saturday to take home the bronze medal in the tournament. 
And you know, in 2020, at the Paralympic Games in Tokyo, they'll be going for gold. That is it for this episode, and this week's featured nonprofit is the Miracle League. The Miracle League removes the barriers that keep children with mental and physical disabilities off the baseball field and lets them experience the joy of America's favorite pastime. Since the main barriers for these adults arise from the natural grass fields used in conventional leagues, the Miracle League teams play on a custom-designed rubberized turf that accommodates wheelchairs and other assertive devices while helping to prevent injuries as well. But it's more than just playing a game. The Miracle League is about making new friends, building self-esteem, and being treated just like other athletes. Check out MiracleLeague.com for more information. Next week's guest is Marcus Fetch. He paints murals that help bring new life to walls and buildings in cities like Birmingham, Alabama. In fact, this weekend he's painting a 500-foot-long art installation with over 100 volunteers this weekend. I'll be there to catch the action. Thank you so much for watching. To help support this show, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave a comment or even a review in the podcast app. It really does help. And thank you so much for your feedback. More episodes are available at Adler.tv. I will see you next week. That's the first time I've rooted against the United States in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs>